Dan Radio Style. Hope everybody out there is having themselves a great day. Chapter 20, Righteousness. It's right there out of the Power of Awareness. Fantastic chapter. Kind of heavy and deep. But he really gets into defining what, one, righteousness is. Two, what that is relative to sin. And it's a little different than the standard kind of biblical assumptions to it. And he also gives us a major key into how so many of us are having a hard time manifesting what it is that we're trying to create by, by not really pulling in these two key ingredients together and really understanding how they work together. We sometimes miss the mark. So in the preceding chapter, righteousness was defined as the consciousness of already being what you want to be. This is the true psychological meaning and obviously does not refer to adherence to moral codes or civil law or religious percepts. You cannot attach too much importance to being righteous. In fact, the entire Bible is permeated with admonition and exhortations on this subject. Break off thy sins by righteousness. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. My righteousness shall answer for me in time to come. Now, in his point, righteousness is what he means by feeling of the power of the wish fulfilled. But very often, the word sin and righteousness are used in the same quotation, much like break off thy sins by righteousness. This is a logical contrast of opposites and becomes enormously significant in the light of the psychological meaning of righteousness and the psychological meaning of sin. Sin means to miss the mark, to not attain your desire, to not be the person you want to be. That is sin. Righteousness is the consciousness of already being what you want to be. Really key things to understand. Righteousness is being what you already desire to be. You're already in that image. You're already wealthy. You're already in that loving environment. You're already in the new house. And sin is when we miss the mark. What does missing the mark mean? Well, Maybe spending some time, he's going to give us a cool example, but spending time working on something, trying to create something in your life, only to have it fail, only to have it not happen yet, only to have it seem like it should have happened by now, but for some reason it hasn't. Goddard gives us a great example of how he means this. It is a changeless, educative law that effects must follow causes, only by righteousness can you be saved from sinning? Only by assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled can you stop missing the mark. If we're missing the mark, we're likely not truly feeling the feeling of the wish fulfilled. We're not getting into it. We might be thinking of money. We might be thinking of this person and seeing their face. We might be thinking of the new house. We might be thinking of the new job, but it's a thing. It's this job. It's this thing. It's not real. We haven't given it any sort of reality. We haven't given it any sort of extra dimension, any sort of additional oomph to kind of let it have a reality inside of us. Let's let this explain more here. There is a widespread misunderstanding as to what it means to be saved from sin. The following example will suffice to demonstrate this misunderstanding and to establish the truth. A person living in an abject poverty may believe that by means of some religious or philosophical activity, he can be saved from sin and his life improved as a result. If, however, he continues to live in the same state of poverty, it is obvious that what he believed was not the truth and, in fact, he was not saved. On the other hand, he can be saved by righteousness. He can be saved by by assuming the feeling of the fit of the wish fulfilled. Now, what he's also saying is I've got some sort of belief that maybe this is happening to me to punish me for something I've done wrong. Maybe this is happening to me because all things are supposed to be a struggle. Maybe this is happening to me because I believe some sort of thing because of religion or whatever that says this is how it has to be. And so we assume that belief And then we say to ourselves, well, if that's the case, then by working extra hard, that's all I need to do to create this outcome. Or by, you know, praying the right number of times a day, then that, of course, will show to the maker that I am obviously worthy of this change. 
And then what ultimately happens, like he says, is, well, what if you finally don't get that thing that you've been praying for or that thing that you've been working extra hard for? What happens when that doesn't show up? Well, one, we tend to be frustrated, sure, right? And two, it kind of disproves that you need to do this thing in order to get what you want. You need to say this affirmation 26 times, and that'll create it for you. But that's not really what does the creating. He's saying that only righteousness can save you from missing the mark. The successful use of the law of assumption would have the inevitable results of an actual change in his life. He would no longer live in poverty. He would no longer miss the mark. He would be saved from sin. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is, accept your righteousness and you shall exceed. The righteousness of scribes and pharaohs, ye shall in no wise. Meaning, ye shall, ye shall enter. If, well, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, what he explains to us here shortly, is the way that other people see you and think about you. Right, Trying to please everybody else. Trying to do what everybody else says. Trying to live by their doctrine trying to do that extra step, trying to do that extra work, trying to work extra hard, trying to say the affirmation 26 times, trying to whatever. And it's that thought process that can lead us to failure. So he's saying if you follow the scribes and Pharisees, if you try to do that thing that everybody else does, then you're not going to get in to your paradise. You're not going to find your kingdom of heaven, as they call it, your wish fulfilled. Scribes and Pharisees means those who are influenced and governed by the outer appearances, the rules and customs of the society in which they live, the vain desire to be thought of well by other men. Unless this state of mind is exceeded, your life will be one of limitation, of failures to attain your desires, of missing the mark, of sin. The righteousness is exceeded by true righteousness, which is always the consciousness of already being that which you want to be. One of the greatest pitfalls in attempting to use the law of assumption is focusing your attention on things, on a new home, on a better job, on a bigger bank balance. This is not the righteousness without which you die in your sins. Righteousness is not the thing itself. It is the consciousness. It's the feeling of already being the person you want to be, of already having the thing you desire. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The kingdom of God. So the entire creation from your I am presence is within you. Righteousness is the awareness that you already possess it all. Now, the key that I want to finish off with, it's the part of the greatest pitfalls. It's in attempting to use the law of assumption is focusing your attention on things, on a new home, on a better job, on a bigger bank balance. So many of us look at being with the person. I want the person in my life. I see us together, whatever. I just, but that's the person and I, right? Or we see that we've got more money or that we see that we have this new job and we see the new job. We see numbers in our bank account. We see winning lotto. We see six out of six, whatever, you know, the thing is, plus the bonus number, whatever, right? But where we fail to use righteousness, to use Goddard's terms, where we fail to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and why we have not really manifested this reality yet. Is when you see the thing, you're taking it out of the context. So let me switch it around. So for example, the specific person you want to be with. It's not just seeing them and then feeling, oh, I love you. That's not really it. That's not the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Think about it from the standpoint of, okay, so you are together. You and this specific person are together. You're married, you're together, you're dating, whatever the thing is. What is your day-to-day -day like? What is your reality like? Are you now constantly thinking about, well, what are we going to make for dinner tonight? I, I know he likes this, and I see this is on sale today, or you know whatever. Or what, what are the different thought processes you're going to have throughout the day? Are there certain times of day where you tend to text each other, where you maybe meet for coffee in the morning, where maybe they come to your house, maybe you wake up together and you've got your routine in the morning? What is that like? Who uses the bathroom first? What are all the things? Now, that is living in the feeling of the wish fulfilled. And when you start to think at it from that larger place, when you start to 
feel it from there, where you start to realize that, wow, there's a lot more going on in this situation. It's not just dating. It's not just the abstract of them being in my life, but it's actually the reality of them being a part of my life. It's one thing to have a scene of them in my life. It's another to literally be thinking like all the different aspects of my life and the things that are going to be impacted by this and how that feels and what that's like and how exciting that can be and how neat it is to be able to rely on somebody to help out in certain ways. Or the idea of being more wealthy. A lot of times people just imagine the wealth, a stack of dollars, a uh, ones uh, with lots of zeros after it in your bank account. And you just imagine that, imagine that, and imagine that. But really, what it is to have more money is different than that. What kinds of restaurants are you probably eating at? What kinds of food are you eating? Where are you living? What kind of house is your house like? When you walk into places, do you concern yourself with the cost of things? Or are you like, yeah, I know I can afford anything in this restaurant. So yes, let's sit down and enjoy ourselves. Let's enjoy this wonderful establishment. I don't walk into it with a timidness. I don't walk into it looking to see, oh my God, I can't believe how much this stuff costs, right? You don't. You walk into a place and you enjoy it. You feel wherever you go. You know you walk down to a car lot, Jaguar lot, and you look at those wonderful cars and you know you can afford them. There's this feeling of comfort and, and security that you have when you have money. So will you imagine all of that that goes with that? If you have to, maybe try to test drive, drive a nicer car. Maybe drive through some nicer neighborhoods. Maybe try, I've said before, try to save a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks in the bank. It's amazing how having a little bit of money stashed away someplace that you know you have helps increase how you feel when it comes to wealth. And wealth is one of those things that you feel your way into. You don't just get money and then feel wealthy. No, you feel wealthy and from that brings money. It rains money on you when you walk around feeling like that all the time. And the way we do that is by getting yourself into that mental space where you're looking at the big picture, where you're living the reality of having your manifestation, the reality of having this thing, not the thing itself. I don't have the thing yet. They haven't called me yet. What is it that you're trying to get? A relationship? Well, you're building that. They've texted you recently. You're talking. You're on a first name basis. You can actually say hi when you see them in the break room. Like, what is it progressing towards? It's not the thing that matters. It's this entire rise, this entire becoming of the feeling of the wish fulfilled. One of the trickiest parts, without a doubt, of manifesting things, as he was saying earlier, it's that desire, right? That burning desire and that immo immobility that we were talking about in yesterday's show. Those three things, right? The immobility kind of working on it and feeling it when you don't have anything else that's really distracting you. And then, of course, assuming the power of the wish fulfilled, righteousness. And through those three things, we shall create our paradise. And through righteousness is the only way we can make up for missing the mark. The only way you can miss, not miss the mark is to become the feeling of the wish fulfilled, to become the owner of the thing in real life. What does that feel like? Spend time thinking about that, feeling it, imagining it. These exercises are huge efforts towards making this become your reality. Dan Radio Style.